Hello and welcome to the Curiosity and Consciousness podcast. The intention of this podcast is to help you to open your mind, get curious about yourself and raise your consciousness levels. Through these conversations, we hope that you will go on an inward journey to discover the truth of who you are and become the conscious creator of your life. I am your host, Karen Maloney, and I work as an inside out coach, mentor and guide, helping women to revolutionize their internal chatter and create a life they love. Listen to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or whatever platform you choose and be sure to like, subscribe, review and share the podcast. Check out my website as well, soulpowerlight.com for more info. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in and joining for a new episode. It is me, Carmeloni. Maloney. And I have another brilliant guest for you today, but just a reminder before we jump into today's episode to join my mailing list, if you so wish. If you go to my Instagram handle at soulpowerlight, click the link in my bio and it's top of the list. I look forward to seeing you there. So then back to today's guest and I have... Taylor Rochesty joining me today and Taylor is the best-selling author of A New 2020 Vision, Cultivate Joy, Reprogram Your Mind and Define Life Through an Authentic Lens. Taylor shares a unique perspective of the uncertainty of tomorrow and an active vision for the future. As a professional athlete who has traveled the world playing basketball, Taylor's message is a humble roadmap to design a new reality reprogram your thoughts and to redefine life through authenticity. He uses his own underdog role and humble approach to meet people where they're at and to embolden others to strive for more and commandeer every opportunity. So this was a brilliant conversation with Taylor as well who shared so much in this conversation about what he's learned really through his years traveling around the world and playing basketball seasons in across Europe and China and how being open-minded is really crucial for us all to be open to new ideas or new thoughts or to be inspired by something someone else says or does or another way of doing things is really important in life. He also shares how his unborn daughter at the time was the inspiration for his book. He also talks about habits of positivity, being rooted in kindness, about how perspective is a great educator and he mentions how when we're at a wedding we're all full of love and we remember how beautiful love is but then two days later we can have a silly argument with a friend or a family member or a partner and the same when it comes to a funeral we appreciate how precious life can be but then also a few days later we can be reactive and shouting at traffic and all these kind of things so keeping perspective really just does help us build more presence and appreciation for the gift that life is. He also talks about the importance of our why and in knowing why we are doing something and also shares how fear really lies in the thinking and in the looking and not actually in the leaping or taking action. So listen to the full episode. Great conversation. I'm sure you'll get lots from it. And if you want to find out more about his work, you can go to his website, www.taylorrochesty, that's R-O-C-H-E-S-T-I-E, taylorrochesty.com. But as always, I will have everything linked as well on the show notes. Enjoy. Welcome everybody and thanks as always for tuning in for another episode. I have the wonderful Taylor Rochesty joining me today. So first of all, Taylor, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, uh, I'm excited for our conversation. Yes, likewise. So am I really looking forward to seeing where the conversation leads today and talking about maybe a bit about your background and your new book that's out as well. But you were a pro athlete for over 11 years. What was that experience like and what did it teach you? Yeah, I just finished my 12th season oh, wow. um, playing overseas uh, all around Europe and, and in China. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually currently looking for where I'm going to be for my 13th season uh, coming up in the fall wow. um, as COVID restrictions and visa processes are uh, making things interesting for me mm. and my family. So we're just trying to find a good spot for all of us. But 
basketball has really taught me so much. Traveling has taught me so much. It's part of uh, how I got into writing this book. Um, I've just realized that so many people share so many similarities and so many differences. We're all looking for connection. We all have uh, what I like to call truths, uh, things that we grew up learning and things that we consider fact or right. And and uh, we learned that a lot of a lot of people have uh, grown up listening and learning from from different people, from different things, reading different books. And um, we're just all looking to make these connections. So the biggest thing that I've learned with traveling and basketball is just connecting with people, being open minded to new cultures, new new ideas, uh, new ways of life, uh, new thought and just being inspired each day with the uh, with just uh, open mindedness uh, for the day and what everything has to offer. Amazing. I love that. And um, I think open mindedness is absolutely crucial. And even more nowadays with all the tensions and stresses and things going on, I think the more open minded we can be and remembering our own innate sameness, although we're very different as well, but that unique truth and energy that runs through us all as well and not forgetting that, I think, amongst it all as well. And yeah, connection, you know, hugely important that we're we're all looking for as well. Just because you mentioned the word as well, and just curious, because as a person who has traveled for years as well, it's one of the best educations I've certainly ever had. And I think even more so now, in the last couple of years, I'm really beginning to understand the the lessons from it. But when you talk about truths as well what do you what do you mean by that well i think it's really really interesting that we were people that love the idea of right and wrong we love the Mm -hmm. idea of being right and so a lot of times what what we forget is if somebody's right then then somebody else can be wrong and so we create this distance and we create boundaries um, with other people uh, especially when trying to make connections I'm from here you're from there this is what I believe this is what you believe and so we develop these truths of what we believe to be true um, and then you meet people and they have totally different beliefs and then we we, we struggle to make that connection with other people um, just because we're we're programmed to feel a certain way and to and to think a, a certain way and so normally that's the way we think because of exactly where we were born who our parents are what schools we went to and so just understanding that different people have different ideas of what's real what's true um, gives you a, an open mind to understand more people to connect with more people and to to learn to grow to evolve I have this idea now that I wake up each day and I tell myself I want to learn something and if I say I want to learn something that that means I'm open-minded to um, to learn you know to to have somebody tell me something that's different than my own beliefs and and to not be close-minded um, when that when that does arise um, and you know from wherever avenue that comes from yeah I love that so true and it's so crucial really because you know like like you mentioned there as well differences in that and often we identify ourselves because sometimes it's the only thing to latch onto is the differences but all that creates is just more separation and then fear of the other as well or fear of another opinion or you know something else being different to what we've thought or what we individually thought or grew up with so you know it really is I love that you know you're sharing these truths again just to remind everyone that and I used to be a person that was so black and white thinking, you know, and actually there is all shades of everything. So um, I love that little reminder again, even for myself. So your your book is out as well, The New 2020 Vision. And wondering what was the the inspiration as well for your book? Well, uh, I have a unique story when it comes to that, because I'm not a huge reader. I'm not a huge writer, although I'm I'm developing more of a reader's mentality and a writing mentality uh as i started writing the book but my wife and i were pregnant with our with our daughter about four years ago and i had an idea to write her my daughter joy uh, a message or a letter that i would actually give her 18 years later maybe when she graduated high school Mm -hmm. and i thought of writing her a letter about goals I had for her, aspirations I had for her, um, ideas that I had for her because she's growing up in a world that's very defined by uh, social media and the exterior. Um, And I wanted her to find herself, learn from some of my mistakes, uh, understand who I was as a person and give her a leg up on the competition, I guess you could say, Mm -hmm. uh, moving forward. And she could get a, a piece of who I was at the time that she was born. And 
we ended up moving to China where, where she was born. Um, and while I was there, I had a lot of time um, traveling on trains and planes and buses and different things like that to develop my thoughts into longer chapters, I guess you could say. And then my wife helped me narrow down because she, she likes to say that I live in the clouds and that uh, I have too many ideas. So she helped narrow down some of my ideas um, into chapters. And then uh, it all of a sudden became a book. So I'm just so thankful for the organic process that happened. But my my unborn daughter at the time was definitely my inspiration. Wow, that's amazing. And what's one of your favorite messages or lessons from it from when you were writing it to your unborn daughter at the time? Uh, the first thing that pops to my mind is th this idea of selfie mode. Um, now that as soon as our cameras had the ability and our phones had the ability to reverse and, and show ourselves, um, we're, we're a, a community and a culture that really likes to uh, keep the focus on ourselves and, and in a positive way sometimes and in a negative way sometimes. And we pick out flaws and pick out weaknesses in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love the idea that we, we take pictures or we, at least we used to take pictures, uh, candid pictures. And then a week later, we'd take it in to be developed. And, you know, we would see those pictures and we would just be excited. Half the pictures would be blurry. Half the pictures we wouldn't even we wouldn't even save. But they were they were just taken authentically. And mm -hmm. we had so much joy and our smiles were so big. And um, we really captured great moments. And now we take 19,000 times more photos. But those photos aren't even shared or they're not even really looked at because we automatically delete them uh, before we even can really look at what's going on. We don't even really look at the background anymore. We just kind of mm -hmm. see these flaws in ourselves and these weaknesses in ourselves. And so I challenge um, the readers in the book that say by the, you know, if we retake the photo four or five times to try to look perfect or act perfect or whatever it might be, then we we've lost our authenticity. It's not even a real smile anymore. It's it's a fake smile by the fifth photo. And it just was a whole metaphor for my hopes for my daughter um, that just that she grows up in her own skin and she's totally happy with who she is and she's authentic in who she is and she feels um, thankful to be exactly who she is in whatever moment she's in. Mm, amazing. Yeah, I think it's an important message for all of us and everyone and especially how, you know, times have evolved in that. And in one sense, you know, we're, we live a life through a lens now, you know, like that even taking, you know, a million photos and it's kind of like, well, what's the ultimate aim at the end of the day? And, you know, sometimes it is to just show that pure perfection, even though someone may be crumbling inside, you know, everyone faces challenges and difficulties. So, it's really an important message as well and to feel comfortable in our own skin and that authenticity i mean that's everything at the end of the day but for me and my work and my journey as well and how i have people that is the work you know one million percent it's it's all great and we all know the idea of it but actually doing the work and getting to that level of comfort and honesty and authenticity within ourselves is the work and I know part of your book as well or in the tagline it's about reprogramming your mind and that's essentially what it comes down to because our thoughts are so powerful so how do you bring that message as well to help people to reprogram their minds or even on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to catch themselves and have that awareness to think something better yeah I think um so much of reprogramming your mind and, and I call them daily applications is so much about habit. Mm -hmm. um, um, in the book, I talk about, um, you know, if you walk into a room and you and everybody's wearing white and you're wearing red, it's really easily noticed. Um, so if you surround yourself with a bunch of positivity, if you create these habits of positivity, that when things are negative or things are going wrong or you're acting a certain way that you know might not be kind or whatever it really jumps out it almost is like a person wearing a red shirt in a room full of white and so um that's the best way that you can kind of bounce yourself back is creating these habits of kindness and and being rooted in that kindness and having a constant perspective of being gentle and open-minded and loving and and uh, heartfelt when it comes to to people and experiences and so then that negativity really jumps out um, from the book, you know, and you can really understand reprogramming the mind is it covers so many bases. You can reprogram how you face adversity. You can reprogram how you experience anxiety. You can reprogram how you envy people or envy things to understand that 
you know, everything can be looked at from a positive standpoint and can be added to your life in a positive way instead of just being stuck with all these emotions that you're not used to dealing with. So learning how to um, shift focus and, and understand who you are and your authentic self and be able to reprogram your mind is super important. And then creating those daily applications that create great habits for yourself. Mm, absolutely. And what was the tool that helped you in that process? I'm, I'm very lucky because I grew up in a very um, privileged uh, upbringing and I had an older brother that I looked up to that always took care of me and always treated me, you know, really great and believed in me and supported me. And, um, and I was a bad kid, you know, that was always pushing the envelope and, and definitely uh, egging him on. And he was always loving and supportive. I had incredible parents that, um, you know, supported my goals and dreams and aspirations. They, they had um, communicational habits and communicational styles that were supportive of, of, of growth and encouragement. And they would ask things like, you know, what else can I do for you? They still ask that when I'm on the phone with them. So I think I'm very lucky to have had that, but I've also had the perspective of realizing that that's not the case for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so, um, whatever you're lacking or whatever, um, troubles you had in the past or whatever, um, you were missing, you know, from your childhood or whatever it is, you can use that as inspiration to be that change that you, that you wish you had, or be that change that you want to see in the world. Um, now having kids, I know that I want them to see me at my best and I want them to pick up the best of me. So I know that I can create that inspiration organically and authentically just by me being at my best. And that will create the norms that my kids see every day. And so if I'm a kind person, then they're going to be rooted in that kindness because that's that's what they're used to seeing. And those are the habits that they'll, they're going to build. Yeah, true. And, um, you know, in one sense, I think, yeah, you were definitely lucky compared to a lot of people because, again, I think cognitively everyone can comprehend that and can understand it on one level but the actual action of getting to living from that place is is a very different thing and you know that is the inner work of clearing out what are the subconscious limiting beliefs we hold you know what are we saying to ourselves constantly inside or internally in our own internal dialogue that maybe aren't isn't best supporting us and it's making that shift to get to that place and I think being rooted in kindness is is absolutely <laughs> crucial as well. But again, how do you help someone or how would you help someone to make the shift to living from a place of kindness as opposed to righteousness? Um, as opposed to righteousness. So I think I think the most important thing you, you kind of touched on the inner dialogue that's going on in your mind. And so like I call it soul communication. So I think it's the most important conversation you'll ever be a part of, which is the mm -hmm. conversation happening, you know, internally. It's what builds your self confidence. It's what builds your character. It's, it's what makes you feel comfortable with any room that you walk in. Um, I have a, 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 a sentence that I like to say that is even when I'm at my worst, I can envision myself at my best. And so I create the choice that even when I'm dealing with problems, even even when I'm at the worst, I can still picture myself at my best. I can still envision it. I can still talk about it. I can still give it detail. I can give it character. I can I can see the positive outcomes because I choose to see that and I choose to shift my mind to see that because I don't believe that negativity or struggle happens in a vacuum. And I don't think that positivity uh, and excitement and optimism happens in a vacuum. And so when think when you're feeling happy, it doesn't mean that nothing in the world is going wrong. It just means that your mind is focused on that happiness. Mm -hmm. And so when, when you're feeling sad, it doesn't mean that happy things aren't happening all around you. You're just choosing to focus on that sadness. And I think all emotions are meant to be felt. And I don't think that somebody should block out all bad emotions and just say, hey, you know, like, I don't need to think about that today. And that's not real because that's not authentic. But I think we do have to understand that idea that it is what we choose to focus on. And if we can learn to be able to give ourselves triggers and these daily applications to refocus our mind towards the positivity, then we can create more sustainable happiness than if we just kind of create a reactive type of culture and just hope that the world is going to be a good day today and that we're going to react well when, you know, when we encounter things. Mm. Yeah, it is completely coming out of that reactive 
way of being and you know the inner dialogue is everything that's why I call myself an inside out coach everything has to start from inside first and the outside follows because it is totally where we choose to put our focus we all have a choice but we often don't see it because we're so clouded in our story in our thoughts we we feel we have to believe them in our emotions and we keep repeating this cycle without realizing that actually we can break it but it is that daily application it takes persistence and consistency and I'm sure that's something you learned that discipline with your career being a professional athlete in that commitment and discipline and practicing every single day and putting a little bit more to it and just building and building and building momentum on a new direction or a skill or whatever the case may be and then just because in going back to your career for a minute as well I know on your website as well you talk a lot about the role of the underdog or you were the underdog and what did you learn from that or the the beauty of the underdog as well well I hope that I'll always be the underdog and I know (laughs) it it doesn't matter if I'm at the the top of the peak of the mountain or at the bottom of the valley um I think creating underdog mentality is incredible. Um, One of the best things about being the underdog is it releases stress and anxiety because a lot of stress and anxiety uh, comes with performance, comes with the idea of success, and it comes with the pressure from to perform from um, from the outside world. If you're the underdog and you're going to be working your ass off, you know, from start to finish, and no matter what, whether you succeed or not, you're still the underdog and you're still knocking on that door. There's nothing that the outside world is going to ask of you that you're not already asking of yourself. And so the pressure from the outside world can can kind of drift away a little bit. And the anxiety that you feel to try to perform for other people can kind of fall by the wayside as well because you're already expecting it of yourself in a very positive way. And it also deals with the progress because I'm going to work hard during the progress. And even if the outcome doesn't come my way, then I'm still the underdog and I'm still going to work hard. And if the outcome does come my way, great. I'm building my habits and I'm still going to be the underdog tomorrow, no matter what. And so when you focus a little bit less on the outcome and more on the journey, then it just, it changes everything. It, it just, you know, it's, you're not having the expectations, you're having goals and you mm-hmm. set goals and you try to make, and you try to make your goal. And if you don't, you, you set a new goal, but if you have expectations then you have the idea of letting somebody down, letting yourself down, And then you feel like you're going to quit. Well, the underdog doesn't quit. So no matter what comes uh, thrown your way, you know, today's going to be the same as tomorrow. And I have a habit of working hard and being that underdog. Mm. Love that. And in one sense, I think we are all the underdogs of our own lives because it is that message to not quit, to not give up, like to keep going and, you know, picking ourselves up and going forward again, no matter what, no matter what's going on, no matter what we're feeling. It's it's knowing that there is a new moment, there is another day, there is another option to make a new choice, to take a new action, to try something new. So I like that underdog analogy. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. I, I talk I talk with a, um, a sales team. I was down in Texas with a friend. He asked me to talk to a sales team. And I was asking them, what was their motivation for working hard or providing or whatever it might be? And a lot of them were talking about the pressure to provide, you know, for family or for themselves or to have a house and to be successful or to find that happiness or to be looked up to by, you know, family or friends or nieces and nephews or whatever that might be. And that's fantastic. You can use that as motivation. But I challenged them and I said, uh, I want, I think you guys should work hard and I want you to work hard because you're a hard worker. Mm-hmm. And once you realize that, why am I doing what I'm doing? Is it to please other people? Why am I being kind? Is it because the person that I'm talking to deserves my kindness? And the answer should be um, maybe, but I'm also being kind because I'm a kind person. I'm working hard because I want to be a hard worker. I want to be able to look in the mirror and say, I'm a hard worker. I'm a kind person. I'm a good person. I'm a happy person. I'm an optimistic person. And then I need to go out and live that life. And I think that's a challenge that everybody should should take because it's another choice that you can make. And it's another way that the internal can affect the external. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I think it is getting to that place as well, because, again, you know, once we begin to question our motivations or why we're doing something or why we're thinking a certain thing, we can really come up with... Well, I know for me at times I was shocked going, oh my 
my God, why am I doing that? Because again, it's so unconscious. You know, what we're doing for the most part are things that we learned in childhood in order to survive or to be loved or to feel like we belong or not to be rejected. So it's normal in one sense because we all have needs to be met and we're doing them this way, but it's so unconscious. And we, when we begin to look within and ask ourselves these questions, we can really be gobsmacked and see, oh my God, I'm actually doing it because I'm expecting something in return, because I want to be acknowledged, because I want to do X, Y, Z, where the truth of it is when we do things purely because we want to do them and because they light us up and because they make us feel good, irrespective of how it's received by another person, that's a whole nother level of living. And that's the, for me, I believe the true way to long lasting fulfillment and joy uh, in life because if we're constantly looking outside of it and just doing it to take a box or to get some recognition it's it's fleeting and it can disappear in a second so well again I just come back to that word it was yeah. so important for me inside out it's really checking ourselves first and going you know and there was a question I came across recently as well or it was something from I was watching a documentary on a near-death experience. I'm fascinated by people who have had near-death experiences who have like crossed over and come back. And one of them I was watching and it said, the only question really at the end of your life when you're doing your life review and you see your actions and you see how they impacted on others, the one question that you'll be asked is, how did you love? And when I remind myself of that question, it just, I'm like, again, it's that thing of, we're here to be our true authentic selves, which I believe is that, you know, love, kindness, peace, ease that lives inside of us and to spread that and not come in back into that, like you mentioned, that reactive culture, that trying to be right and proving ourselves and being unable to be with someone with a differing opinion. So I know you talk about as well uh, perspective as an educator, and I'd love to know how that has been useful as well in your life. Yeah, I just think that um, everything can be looked at from a different vantage point. Um, having a having a, a constant perspective that I call um, changes everything because uh, I, I went to a, a memorial service when I was in high school, um, and it was really sad because the person that came up and was speaking um, said, why does it take something like this for the community to come together, for the community to love one another, for the community to talk to one another, to try to you know, have good, uh, good conversations that come of this. We, we come together around these high, high notes and then low notes in life. And then we lose the perspective a day or two later, you know, we go to a wedding and we, we think about how beautiful love is. And then the next day we have a fight with a friend. Um, we go to a funeral and talk about the, how precious life is. And then two days later we're yelling because we're stuck in traffic. Um, keeping that constant perspective and being able to have things that can, humble you down to to realize the beauty of life is super important as a basketball player i always try to pick out a kid in the in the crowd or the kid in the audience every time i think that my legs hurt i try to pick out someone less for uh, less fortunate as far as not being able to play my style of basketball that might be in a wheelchair not less fortunate in life but maybe he always wanted to be a professional basketball player and he was never able to walk um and i try to keep certain perspective like that that humbles me down and lets me realize that uh, I'm living a dream every single day. I'm alive. I'm happy. For some reason, I'm alive in this moment, and I'm going to take advantage of that. I'm going to act accordingly. I have a really great friend of mine that passed away, and I try to carry on his memory, not just by talking about him, but by bringing out the best from who he was and uh, living my life to the fullest and understanding that Life is so short and so fleeting. And so just constantly having that perspective and surrounding yourself with people that can, you know, give you that perspective. I say highlighting happiness in the book, but also highlighting perspective, people that can, you know, you surround yourself that says, hey, you know, things are looking good or things are are great, uh, even when you're at your worst, um, I think is just key to sustainable happiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that. And, you know, life is fleeting and we do forget so quick sometimes, like you mentioned, using the, the analogy of being at a wedding and a funeral and how, how quick we can be to forget again these these truths. Um, I'm curious as well, do you have some belief in some higher power or guidance that is supporting you as well? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's my foundation. I'm definitely a, um, a believer in God, and that's definitely my foundation. And it is rooted all throughout the book. It's definitely rooted in who I am, and it creates a, a, a very, very strong foundation. And I know it's the whole idea of never, never up too high, never down too low, and that that consistency in your life. And then you can use that in so many different ways. And I've used that in basketball. I've used that in life. I've used that in love. I've used that in relationships. And so um, to 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 have that as a root um, is just amazing because um, I'm not going to be perfect. The people I'm around aren't perfect. And you can look at it as a way of being let down or you can look at it as a way of um, just being unique, being authentic, being real. And so um, – just enjoying every part of life and just enjoying flaws and enjoying imperfections and all that kind of stuff because you're rooted in something in something higher for sure. Yeah, I think it's so true and so important to have some kind of a foundation like you like you mentioned, because then it really does help to gain that perspective and then come out of the tit for tat living and, you know, that reactive sense of, you know, hoarding and just thinking about ourselves. It is that bigger picture as well. Um, And then something that just popped into my head as you were talking and something that I know a lot of people face and deal with, and that's rumination. And I'm wondering how in relation to your basketball career, when it is such a high pressure shot or that moment where it's the, the score for the whole game or the season or whatever, and if it went bad, quote unquote, last time, how in that moment do you kind of forget about what happened before and just allow that presence and to be in that moment of taking that shot? Well, I think you first you just have to be uh, alive in all your moments. You've got to be searching for these moments. And those are, those are the times that you feel most alive, whether you make the shot or miss the shot. The interesting thing about sports is um, – you practice for a reason, you know, practice can make perfect practice gives you the ability to make a higher percentage of shots maybe, but nothing from the past is going to help you make that big shot. When that shot, when that shot comes, it might go in, might not nothing from the past in a bad way. If you've missed it a thousand times, doesn't mean you can't make it. So living in your moments is definitely um, something that everybody should strive to do and realize that at the end of the day, uh, I like, I like the idea of I'm either winning or I'm losing, but either way I'm playing. And so I want to be I want to be playing the game of life. I want to be in the game for basketball. I talk in the book about being a fourth quarter player. I want to be in the game when when it matters most. I don't want to be sitting on the bench watching it from the side. And so whatever your field is, whatever your court is, living for those moments and realizing that those are special and not creating anxiety from it and just letting it define you because failure, failure, failure. I hope I fail and I hope I lose a whole bunch of times because that's going to help lead me to who I am. It's going to help me learn. It's going to get me to the end. And um, recently I started, I'm not a video game player, but I started thinking of video games and like Mario Brothers and Mario and Luigi and trying to get to the next, get to the next stage. And when you, when you're learning how to play these games, unless you have the cheat sheet next to you, you're you're just experiencing and you're losing and losing and losing over and over again until you realize how to beat each level. And until you lose over and over again, you can't figure it out because you don't know what's behind door number one, or you don't know what's behind um, this wall. And what, and once you experience it, once you lose, you start over on that level and then you, you know what's coming for the next time. And so you get better and you get more experienced. And so when those moments come, it's just amazing to, to, to be there. It's amazing to live your life. It's amazing to be part of something real. And I think that we should be seeking out and searching for those moments instead of shying away from them. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, it's true, even the, the video game analogy as well, like it is that action and that practicing that really helps us expand and up level, whether it's in a game or whether it's actually the game of our life. So I love that. It's so powerful. And, You know, it's really admirable and maybe it's something in sportsmanship, but I think like a lot of people stay in that place of rumination. And I love in A Course in Miracles, one of the lessons is I only see the past. And I think that's so true for so many people. All they do is just bring the past and what happened before. And we we often can't allow a moment to be a moment and to be a brand new moment and to unfold how it's meant to unfold in that moment because we're so wrapped up with what happened before, what happened in the past, the last time I was here, oh, this is going to go. So I think it's really powerful to be able to live in those moments and 
I remember I watched the documentary, Michael Jordan's documentary. What's it called again? Mm -hmm. Last Dance or something. That was brilliant. And believe me, I'm not, I don't know anything about basketball being Irish or anything, but it was an absolutely brilliant documentary. But I never forget at one stage during some critical game or whatever, and it was the last quarter of that, and a journalist asked Michael, oh, are you feeling the pressure or what are you going to do? You know, there's, there's this last point that everything's riding on for the championship or that. And then they were like, are you worried? And I remember he he answered and he was like, how would I be worried about something that hasn't happened yet? And I just thought it was so powerful because that's it, essentially. We're also worried about things that haven't happened yet. And we ruminate and we spend so much time focusing on what might happen or what might go wrong. And we miss the whole present moment we miss the whole opportunity of what may be or the possibility in the now so I'm sure from practice and training helps you to build that presence but what else outside of that do you have any other tools or practices that really help you to cultivate just that presence and that connection to each new moment as as it rises well I heard an amazing story and I'll have to figure out who told me and what golfer it was but golf is such a mental sport and mental game and um there was a golfer that was asked you know what is he thinking about as he approaches each ball you know they have to walk the course it takes about four hours so they're walking the course and they're walking up to the next ball they're walking up to the next ball they're doing a lot of walking and they're doing a lot of high pressure a lot of people watching you know nobody to make the mistake except for you and they said what are you thinking about he's like I'm not thinking about the shot or worried about the shot because there's nothing I can do until I get to the ball. Mm -hmm. So I can't take the shot until I actually get up there and see it. And, you know, what am I going to worry about? Because when I get there, it might be um, in the rough and not in the fairway. It might be behind a tree. It might be, you know, I don't know the shot I'm going to shoot until I get there. So I learned a great lesson from that where it's just you never really know and you can anticipate it and you can debate it and uh, you can talk about it. But until you're there, that you shouldn't really worry about. You should be happy about the journey instead of just trying to get to this one little spot or worry about this one moment. What if it ha- What if it comes where I have to shoot this last shot? Well, when it comes, it's going to feel natural. Playing basketball for so many years, uh, people ask me about the crowds and the pressure. Well, I only notice the crowd when I'm stuck when I stop moving. And so in the book, I I, I say fear is in the the looking, not the leaping. And I've, and I've developed it more, the idea of fear is in the thinking, not the leaping. Fear is not in the action itself. Fear is in the thinking about the action. So the action is more of a, a reaction or just an action as opposed to the thinking about it. We contemplate and contemplate and contemplate, and we don't even know what it's going to be like when it comes. And so even if you think, what am I going to do during this shot? You don't know what the defense is going to be like. You don't know if you're up one point, down one point. You don't know if it's going to be a half-court shot or if it's going to be a free throw or if it's going to be a layup for those people that know basketball terms. But it, you, you just don't know until it comes. And so if you're just thinking about it too much and you're forgetting about the moments that you're actually living while you're thinking about other moments. So just be more present and more mindful in, in the moments that you're in and be part of this, I call it a 95%, you know, everybody's focused on this pinnacle 5% of their life and just be focused more on the 95. Mm. Yeah, it's true. And like that, there's so many different ways for people to connect to that. And again, it's a practice, whether it's through meditation, being in nature, painting, whatever it is to build that, that comfort really with being okay with the unknown because actually when you get really present you realize oh hell like you just mentioned we can never know how anything is going to go ever 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 even with all the planning all the thinking all the imagining all the working out every scenario we will still never know how it goes until that moment and I always say as well that's part of the job is getting really comfortable in the unknown because most people hate the present moment because like you mentioned they're only focused on the destination they're only focused where i want to be there i'm not there so i feel really shitty and horrible and i'm just going to continue to feel crap whereas when we realize the only way to get to where we want to go is through every each and every single moment and the more that we can enjoy that moment like the journey like you're mentioning it shifts everything because then even the destination can change but you don't care because it feels so good because you're just enjoying it and living in that space. So really, I think powerful reminders and messages again for everyone. And just before we wrap up, I'm curious to know 
if with all the interviews and years of traveling and basketball in other countries and doing lots of interviews and all things, has there ever been a question that you haven't been asked that you always love to be asked? <laughs> That's interesting. Um, I don't know. I think I think the, the questions are all out, out there. I just love organic conversations like this one where you just uh, you kind of see where it goes and, you know, see what happens. I, I love questions about daily applications. Some people some people um, they hear a lot of quotes and inspirational things, but they 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 don't have the inspiration or the guidance as far as daily applications that they can implement into their life. And that's one thing I try to do with the book is give people simple and really easy steps or or mindful things to think about during their day that could help them because everybody has their own journey that something might work for me, but it might not work for somebody else. But I give little reminders and little ideas and, and inspiration to, to, to change your day and be proactive in your own happiness. And so just daily applications, I I would say, are the things that I I love talking about just because we have the power to change our future. We have the power to be happy today. We have the choice to be happy today. And just people need to unlock that in their mind. Mm -hmm, Totally. And like you say, it is a personal self-exploring journey as well, because we'll all find our groove and what feels good for us. But then last question, what is your favorite daily application? Uh, well, I'm started a couple new ones recently. Um, I have a I have a son that just turned one, and he's in a room that's really close to me. And I wake up every morning by hearing him cry and trying to get out of bed. And the first thing I have to tell myself every morning is two words, and it's just thank you. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't matter if it's 3 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 10 a.m. Um, I'm gonna wake up saying thank you. I'm 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 thankful that he's crying and healthy and happy and needs me and. The fact that I'm a father, the fact that I'm a husband, the fact that I have another day to live, the fact mm. that the sun came up again. And I have a thousand reasons to be thankful. So an incredible daily application is finding reasons to be thankful instead of complaining or, or, or being frustrated by other things. Finding reasons to be thankful and constantly seeking out thankfulness is just an incredible way to live. Yeah, absolutely. That gratitude. That's the first thing I say to myself every morning as well. Thank you for years and years and years. And like that, I would even invite people to just start saying it. You don't even have to say anything in particular. Just start saying the words of thank you, thank you, thank you. And internally, a shift will happen. So then you will drop more into the presence. And I know for me, it felt like a veil was lifted off my eyes. And then I actually started seeing every tiny thing around me in my environment going, wow, wow, look at all these things. Like, where do they come? come from we're we're so asleep we don't even see them so thank you is such a powerful powerful little tool and daily application to play with and again it's always the practice the consistency that you will begin to feel shifts doing things every once in a while doesn't really help so much um so taylor thank you for joining today and sharing and please before you leave will you share where people can find out more about your work and your book well Twitter, I think I'm T Rochester one, uh, Instagram, I'm at T Rochester. Um, and then the best is, uh, my website, taylorrochester.com. I think you got the link below or the spelling below because I've had my name mispronounced in a thousand different languages. It feels like, <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, just taylorrochester.com. I love connecting. I love being part of, um, this message of positivity. So I'm there and reach out and you can find out more information about, um, speaking and, uh, where I'm playing and how the book's going and all that kind of stuff. So I love the I love to communicate and have people reach out. Fantastic. And as always, I will have everything linked from the show notes as well to all your website and socials. And again, just thank you so much and keep keep up the good work. Thank you so much. It was so much fun to to spend the time with you and have a conversation. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you get notified every time a new show is released. Get more information on this week's guest as well on my website www.soulpowerlight.com.